So, welcome along to In Conservation With. I'm with my special guest and friend, Joel Ashton. Joel, um, I've known you for a few years now. We actually are mates, or should I say um, neighbours even. We're mates as well, but neighbours yeah. within the British Birdwatching Fair, Marquee 8. We always um, end up sort of being next to each other, and I am always envious of your amazing stand. Well, it's it's not without a lot of hard work, I must say. <laughs> there's not a there's not a bird fair we've been to that's been where well, we've had a finish less than about or well, before ten o'clock on the Thursday Thursday night. I don't think, but uh, nice to know the appreciation in the way, and it always draws in some good crowds, doesn't it? You know, it's nice for people to see what you can do within a little three by three meter plot, which is. Uh, a nice challenge. I like it. Once a year is enough, though. So <laughs> yeah, well, it's going to be once every two years now, or at least next year. Yeah. Um, now, I'm a complete gardening philistine. Um, I, for example, was the boy as a kid. You know, I was a boy that was pushed out into the garden to water the garden as punishment. <laughs> and actually, I loved it because it got me connected to nature, and I was actually doing a lot of birding whilst I was gardening. Um, can you? Tell us, just sort of give us a breakdown as to how you got to be sitting in front of us now. Um, well, I think for any of you that have logged on that may have already purchased my new book, uh, you will have perhaps read the, the intro where there's a picture of um, me and Jim and they're sat by our first wildlife pond when we were about eight and ten, I think, something like that. Um, and that brother, really was the brother, brother, no, Jim's your brother. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. So Jim's my brother, and we we was we sat by this little pond, and it was just um, a wonderful place to to spend a Sunday afternoon or after school when we come back, you know, and uh, and just watch the the you know lift the the turf that went over the grass that went over the edge, and there would be you know little tadpoles underneath or um, common or smooth newts under there. And I think it was just that mesmerisation of a, of a pond, you know, we can all, I mean, it doesn't matter what age you are, 20, 30, 15, 5, 60, it doesn't matter. You look into a pond and you just find yourself transfixed, you know, with whirly gig beetles and pond skaters, water boatmen. And I think that was kind of what gripped us. But um, it was also, we were influenced a lot by our dad. He was a, a, a big birder back in the day and, and he... You know, grew up um, surrounded by the moors uh, to the eastern side of Manchester, and he, you know, he was a big influence. We used to go bird watching with him. He's a big fisherman, so we used to spend hours sat on the river bank, and of course, with that, we'd have kingfishers darting past. Occasionally, you'd be lucky enough to have one, you know, perch on the end of a fishing rod. Um, and and mum was was big into horticulture, and so was our grand. So they were big. Uh, Jeff Hamilton fans went back when Jeff used to do Gardens World, and um, so it kind of everything knitted together. Really, you know, we were surrounded by wildlife and horticulturists uh, or horticultural uh, enthusiasts, shall we say? And um, yeah, we we decided. Well, as soon as I well, I, I actually left school. I'm a bit of a delinquent, really. I shouldn't really be here. Um, I, I I haven't actually got any A levels, so. Uh, yeah, don't publicise this recording too much, will you, Dave? But um, I, I actually left um, left school because I, I, I wanted to get my hands dirty. And basically, I then decided that, you know, I would go into pursue a career in landscaping, which I did. And I've never looked back since. But I sort of set up the business in 2005 um, as Hazelwood Landscapes. And then from there... We sort of decided that, you know, attitudes were changing and we could actually kind of manipulate gardens into wildlife habitats. Um, and of course, because we'd spent a lifetime watching wildlife, you know, we could sort of use those experiences to say, right, we know where robins nest. We know what size hole um, uh, a blue tip will use in a nest box. You know, um, we know how to get dragonflies, butterflies into the garden. Uh, and really that kind of landscaping background gave us a great um, kind of a broad spectrum of 
abilities to, you know, really change the way gardens are seen. And um, so we could add the structural elements in, which of course we all need a patio to sit on. You know, we all want somewhere to uh, have a cup of tea of a morning or a glass of wine of an evening. Uh, yet, you know, at the same time, these gardens can be absolute little oases for wildlife and look great as well. So, you know, those three boxes, like the practicality, um, the formality, uh, and the wildlife benefits really, you know, we, we kind of found a bit of what we thought was the USP for us. And I think that it kind of went from there really. And, and so it kind of went from strength to strength. And uh, obviously the bird fair was a big thing for us. And once we decided we'd, we'd take, take this route down the, the wildlife garden uh, or into the wildlife gardening world, it, it, at the time when we did, you know, we were almost having to persuade people to, uh, put a nest box up whereas you know nowadays attitudes have changed with spring watch and everything else um you know it's a it's a much different world and everybody's a lot more aware of insect declines and you know climate change and everything else so that i think everybody is 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 conscious they need to do their bit and um and so therefore you know we thought right okay attitudes are changing but where's our market how do we find our our, our target audience and, and through things like the bird fair, of course, which you mentioned uh, and advertising in magazines such as the RSPB's Nature's Home. Um, I'm obviously a uh, ambassador for butterfly conservation and the British Dragonfly Society. And it's making connections like that, that, you know, word spread that we were introducing habitats from postage stamp back gardens right the way up to almost um, nature reserve level. So, you know it was offering that service because all these you know whether it's a wildflower meadow wildlife pond you know planting trees and shrubs for birds it can be applied to whatever size piece of land you're talking about it's just you know just it's just maximizing the potential for that plot um and so with all that and with like i say the ambassadorships and uh then last year we did a piece on gardeners world which was phenomenal i mean the response was brilliant and they actually said that the, it was one of the best food shows it had, not purely because of the piece on us, but it was a wildflower special. And I think that just goes to show again that the, the need for uh, and the, the drive to, to sort of encourage more, more sort of native wildflowers into people's back gardens. And here we are today, you know, it's, uh, it's been of a, a bit of a journey. And of course, it's all kind of peaked with the, the release of the book, which has been fantastic. And I can't thank Dawn Kindersley enough for that. They've done a wonderful job. And, uh, you know, yeah. the, have you got the book there? Uh, funny you ask. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah, a little bit of promo. But no, it's, it's I mean, hopefully, I mean, it's, there's 15 years or more, well, 30 if we include the, uh, the wildlife uh, experiences but um there's a there's a hopefully a wealth of knowledge in there that will um and and i think the 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 key thing about it was that dawn and kindersley came, i mean we feel very privileged that they came to us to say look you know we think times are changing we want a book wildlife gardening how you're fixed and and that really has been uh, a quite a humbling moment because it, it shows a need that you know that hopefully we can um you know, give this information to a whole host of people, you know, who've got anything from, like I said, a postage stamp to a big piece of land, and they can apply some of the techniques in the book and some of the ideas and the theory behind it to their own gardens. As much as I'd love to get to all, however many tens of millions of gardens there are in the UK, I've only got one pair of hands. So by offering the book, it's of course a great way of sharing that knowledge. Um, and hopefully it'll be one that, that does really well, not just for the, the few pence of book that, that I get, <laughs> but, for, but for the, the, you know, wildlife in general. And that's the whole point, you know, that's the, that's the mission is to, is to create habitats nationwide <clears throat> uh, to, to provide more of a mosaic and a network of gardens that all these animals can move between effectively. Yeah. And I think there's a, a big job to be done because I mean, I remember being on the uh, metropolitan line in London, um, going from station to station and you drive, or drive you you know the train goes through areas and look at people's back gardens and i was horrified from back gardens mm -hmm. astroturf you know astroturf oh, yeah. wooden fencing completely sterile and there's one time i was in someone's garden and um 
I, you know, they were saying, no, there's no wildlife in my garden. I said, well, you know, people who have astroturf, who put wooden fencing in, who basically plants flora that's not native to this country, that doesn't attract insects. I mean, what more do you expect? And then I turned around and noticed that I was just describing their garden. Yeah. And I was never invited back since. <laughs> um, that's a big job. But what's, in terms of your actual work, what, what elements of it do you actually love? What's your favourite part of, of, your, of what you do? What, what, you know, what, what is it that you actually love doing if someone says to you, you know, can you, whatever you love, can you just do it in my garden? Well, I think for me, it's the, obviously, I mean, I love doing the wildlife ponds. I think they're great. You know, the, the moment you turn the tap on, um, obviously, ideally, you'd put natural rainwater in there. But of course, a lot of these projects, I'm in and out within a week, so I don't have time to let <laughs> this time of year, I'd be a bit scuppered, you know. But um, but actually putting a tap on in a pond for the first time is great. And I've, I've had literally um, water boatmen and pond skaters sort of bounce off me and land in the water. Yeah, as these water bodies are filling up, how they find them, God alone knows, but they do. Um, but I think for me, probably the best bit is, you know, every year, certain times throughout the year. So I'm expecting within the next sort of two to three weeks to get a few emails from people who I've done a wildlife pond for. And they'll, you know, email a photo through um, perhaps a year, you know, after the pond was done and say, look, here's a broad body chaser on the dragonfly perch that you put in for the pond and everything else. And I think it's, it's moments like that when, when, you know, I feel very humbled, the fact that, you know, people are coming back and saying, look, because you've done this, this is now in the garden because you planted some honesty and some garlic mustard. There's now orange tips breeding in the garden, orange tip butterfly, um, you know, or, 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 sort of slightly longer term obviously with planting trees and shrubs it can take four or five years for them to mature but you know, one job we did for um a, a good friend of ours um in the in the fens the lincolnshire fens and he's he's surrounded by agriculture and we put some whips in as a hedge uh just you know the little sort of two foot uh, plants and within four years, um, there was breeding yellow hammer and white throat in the garden, which is, you know, just phenomenal. Um, and it's things like that. I think it's the success stories that come of these, these wild um, places that, um, you know, and it's, it's, people, it's people's own experiences that I, you know, um, really enjoy. I enjoy hearing about them when people say, look, because, you know, you've had a bit of an influence by the time, you know, um, sometimes I'm in someone's garden for several weeks. So I can't help but, you know, as you do with the hashtag look up, I'm always in the garden. I mean, we did, I did a job in um, Birmingham recently for um, a lady that works at Bat Conservation. And she, uh, she, was, she already had a bit of a bird list. And I, I went into the back garden absolutely hell-bent on, you know, doubling the amount of species just through you know, recognition of call and that for things flying over. And it was great. And I love doing things that I had, you know, um, red pole, siskin, raven, you know, all the sort of things that unless you're tuned into it, unless you've been listening to birds for a long time, a raven's pretty obvious, but, you know, siskin and red pole, you know, they take a bit of uh, deciphering at first. Um, and it's things like that, you know, I, I, it's nice to know that I've had a positive influence on someone and that they are then, you know, thinking of those things perhaps after I've left um, if that makes sense so it's nice to get those you know kind of experiences and, and, and feedback you know as to how the garden's doing I think is the best bit. Yeah and one thing I'm, I want to ask you as well is I mean for example for me when I'm leading tours or taking people around I think my least favourite element of what I do is walking through jungles I, I can't get in my head around them at all just, <laughs> that's my heading. I can't say I've ever had that privilege today who knows. <laughs> What is the, the thing that someone's asked, if someone, I mean, maybe, I don't know, I should, maybe I shouldn't ask you this, but if, if someone asks you this, you kind of think, what's the, what's the least favourite thing? Is it like laying paths or something? Or um, Probably if someone was to ask me to clear out a pond in January, to be fair. <laughs> um, I, I think it probably is the weather. I mean the rain in september and october i was working in wales last year and it was just every day for about 
eight weeks and I was up to my ankles in what could only be described as slop you know um, it was a lot of the kind of harder harder landscaping elements you know sort of walling and paving before the turf and the, you know the wildlife pond and everything went in but that doing that background work or the groundwork if you like in those conditions it's just it can sometimes feel relentless you know <laughs> a little bit demoralizing and you just got to think of spring and brimstones and orange tips and you know um so for me it becomes a bit more of a challenge what i'm trying to do is structure the business so that you know in the winter months i'm not actually is installing as much if i can because it does i mean in a serious note you know it, it does prove quite tricky you know um tree planting as well of course you don't want to plant trees if it's too wet um you know depending on the species and all that so yeah I'd probably say weather is my <laughs> the biggest problem in winter. I don't mind the job, you know, I don't mind getting up, you know, to two, three feet in silt in the middle of a pond with waders on if I have to, you know, it's it's all part of the job. But when it's freezing cold, driving rain, January, and, you know, you're trying to set concrete or, you know, plant plants, and it's just, yeah. <laughs> I wish I had an office job at that point, so I might turn to a bit more writing in the winter months if I can help it. <laughs> Okay, so listen, uh, Zoomers, fellow Zoomers in this, uh, in conservation with, um, session with Joel Ashton, if you wish to ask questions, please um, feel free. For those who aren't familiar with the way Zoom works, it took me a bit of time. Um, if you go to the participants bit, um, apparently you can sort of show your hand and wave and hopefully you'll be able to see it. Because I can't see you, especially if you haven't got your camera on. So if you can wave, um, if you've got any kind of, burning questions regarding your own garden or any kind of uh, advice you'd like to have then you know Joel's here for that so please don't be shy um Joel in terms of now lockdown time for a lot of people around the world um what have been what's been the sort of common questions you've been getting regarding gardening um so availability of a lot of things has been a problem for people because of course garden centers in the first instance were completely shut so everybody sat at home fabulous weather i mean april has just been phenomenal hasn't it you know we've had about one two days of rain and yet people are looking at the garden going i can't get any plants what we're going to do <laughs> um so it's been tricky so but a lot of the um so seed merchants and places like that were still um are still selling seed shipping out seed um, and one thing that I love to do, which you can still just about get in now if you if you get round to it, is is sowing a little patch of cornfield annuals. Uh, so things such as your poppies, your cornflowers, corn marigold, corn chamomile, um, corn cockle, bit of a recurring theme here. But um, you know, so get you know get some uh, even if it's just a tray, and and this applies to people with even a balcony. Um, and I. I uh, you know, I would strongly recommend sowing some cornfield annuals. It's dead easy. Um, get yourself some not too high nutritional value compost if you can, or if you've got a patch in the garden that you can just turn over if it's a bit weedy or you don't know what to do with, you haven't got the time or the money to go out and buy a load of um, herbaceous perennials. And I would just turn it over, rake it level, pick the worst of the roots and stones and bits and pieces out and literally chuck some cornfield annuals on it. Uh, and within a couple of months, they will absolutely be a, a blaze of colour. You know, you'll have your, you know, typical reds, blues, yellows, uh, and it'll be fantastic. It's quite a, a short flowering period, so it's not much, you know, um, towards the end of summer. You know, these are annuals, obviously, like poppies and that, you know, they're, they're pretty quick coming and going. But it's a great splash of colour. It's a great way of filling a bit of ground that you don't know what to do with. Uh, as long as it's got a bit of sun for half the day, then... Um, it should be absolutely fine and it's a great one for the kids as well i mean if you've got kids that are driving you up the wall and you know they need something to do then then get them out and get them digging a border over or you know i mean there's photographs of, of me when i was a kid digging digging holes and pestering mum and dad with a spade when i was about four you know and um i think you know all kids love snails worms grubs they love to get dirty so i, I would just get them out there if you can and dig a bit of a, an area over and chuck some cornfield on it and, and do keep in touch i'd love to see what what you get coming to these different wildflowers um you know and that that's so that's one thing you can do another thing that i've actually just done that i'm just gonna uh, i'm about to put a video on on my um uh, YouTube channel is I've just put uh, I've just made my own um, little mini barrel pond 
which is great because a lot of these places, uh, the garden centres or online places are still shipping out barrel ponds now. And um, Well, I say barrel ponds, they're not advertising them as barrel ponds, but uh, you know, most people usually advertise them as planters, you know, sort of the, the half whiskey barrel sort of thing. So they're about two foot across by about 18 inches deep. Um, and if you get the right one, you can actually get them pretty watertight um if you just fill them up first with water just test before you put all your plants and everything in um fill them up first to make sure the wood if they've been sat obviously for a while they might have shrunk and dried out a bit so they're not quite water type but fill them up first it may seep out a little bit you'll need to kind of keep, keep the water topped up um but yeah barrel pond absolutely brilliant uh, and um you know things you'll still get your dragonflies and damselflies coming to lay eggs in it if you've got a bit of oxygenating plant in it things like hornwort um, as long as you've got some emergent vegetation for these insects, um, which is which is very important because of course the nymphs once they're emerging and they're wanting to sort of you know um, turn into their their adult form if you like, they need some vegetation to climb up and uh, spread their wings and dry out in the sun before they sort of make their their maiden voyage if you like or their maiden flight. Um, you know, and then some floating leaf plants as well, things like lilies, but I always put in uh, either sort of fringe water lily uh, or broadleaf pond weed or something like that, just to, as a bit of a water surface covering plant. Um, and they work really well and the, the kids love them. My kids are just, you know, always got a little net in there. I feel for a, a snail in one of my wildlife ponds because they're, <laughs> they're always being disturbed. Well, not too often, but you know, so kids love them and they're great. You can just walk up to them, have a quick look in, see what's going on. And you can get pond skaters, water boatmen, diving beetles if you're lucky. Um, you know, and if you've got, just remember to put a bit of a branch or something in so that people can actually, um, people i wouldn't expect anyone climbing out on a branch of a barrel pond um but sorry birds and things as well they're a, they're a great um great source of water for birds of course now is not so bad but if we have you know weather like we've had in april in july and august time you know a lot of the natural resources for birds will dry up so if you've got a barrel pond they are great for you know birds to bathe from i mean dave you probably know a few more of the stats than i do but you know birds do need to bathe quite regularly um and if you've got that source of water, they can bathe and of course they can drink from it at the same time. Um, so yeah, Barrel Pond is a, is a really good little project and it's one that doesn't cost the earth. I got my barrel for about 35 quid delivered, I think, something like that. Can you describe um, a Barrel Pond? Because remember, I'm a complete Philistine and I'm, I don't know mm. how, uh, how knowledgeable well, our guests are, but... Um, I'm sure we all know what a whiskey barrel looks like, Dave. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not suggesting anything, but you know, if you've got a, uh, if you imagine a full whiskey barrel, I mean, they are about probably three, four feet tall, um, but they're effectively just a barrel cut in half with a couple of metal bands around them, um, and um, yeah, just important you wash them out first. If they come smelling of alcohol, then obviously it's not going to be a great pH for your water. Um, so you know, best to kind of let them soak. Let all the kind of if there is any sort of alcohol left in them depends how they are again left or been cleaned or who, who's selling them so just check that but yeah a, a great little a great little thing but of course if you haven't got a barrel or if you've got some people who are fortunate enough to have to have you know one of the old um belfast sinks uh just knocking around in the back garden you know you can soon soon add a few bits and bobs to that um and put some stones in on one end so that you know um amphibians reptiles can get in and out and some logs up the other side it so that it creates a little bit of a ramp in and out um or you can sink them in the ground if you're feeling particularly energetic um barrel ponds of course it means you've got to dig an 18 inch deep hole so <laughs> it requires a bit more uh, input than than a belfast sink probably but um yeah a little mini pond and I've actually in the past made a lot of uh, many what, what I would call frog hostels, which are a little, um, imagine like a Belfast sink, or sometimes you can get these kind of York stone sort of troughs and things, which are only, they're only shallow. I mean, they're only maybe four or five inches deep, um, but just sink them into the ground, um, put some old bark and things inside it and put some logs over the top. Uh, and and I've lifted those up in gardens before, and it's been absolute just frog mayhem. You know, there's like little baby frogs, like, you know, sort of just emerge, and they've gone straight under and into these little frog hostels. And you can put them in your border, your herbaceous borders, down the bottom of the garden, under a tree, and you'll be amazed what stuff you use them. So, um, yeah, great one they are. Um, we've got a couple of questions 
Oh, I'm glad you did, actually, because Carol, Carol, sorry, Carol, Claire is saying that yeah, you can use large plants as well, or pebble fountain bases, which are large, round, and reasonably cheap. Reasonably deep. Yeah. Yeah, good to see Claire, fellow barrel pond user. Um, yeah, so a pebble fountain. Yeah, again, good. I mean, I suppose that's going down a bit more of the route of the um, yeah, bird bathing uh, sort of element. But uh, again, I mean, you, you'll probably agree with me, Dave, you know, providing water for birds is, is key throughout the year, isn't it? Yeah, totally. Now, just actually funny, Ronique has just asked a question because I was just about to say before these questions came up, um, was it the same deal overseas? Because I know that, for example, Ronique is actually from America and I know there's a lady who's also from in, in France, even though she probably is English, but she's living in France. Is it the same rules in terms of what you're saying in those countries or is, is it different? Do you know? For what? So is it some mosquitoes you're saying? Yeah. So does the balcon have to move? Have, have to have moving water to prevent mosquitoes from hanging out while you're encouraging that as food for birds? Um, mosquitoes, unfortunately, there's no worldwide cure for them. <laughs> but actually, there is. If you can get yourself about half a dozen common pipistrelle bats, they'll uh, they'll do a great job for you once they emerge. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's it's a funny one actually because you can't really deter mosquitoes. They're, they're just going to turn up. What I have found though is that they are the actual adult mosquitoes are more likely to be hanging around areas where it's sort of semi shade or even full shade. Um, so if you, for example, put your barrel pond or your small water feature in, in the middle of the garden where it's pretty sunny, um, beneficial for humans in the evening for you to then go and have a look at it without the risk of being eaten alive under a tree looking into your barrel pond. You know? um, but the actual insects themselves, I mean, I've seen mosquitoes in plant pots, you know, that have got an inch of water in them. They just, you can't really determine where they lay or what they lay. Uh, or sort of how many they lay, for example. I've got loads in my pond at the moment. It's in the middle of the garden. But the upside, of course, is you have to think, I mean, a crazy fact, uh, common pipistrelle bats can eat something like two and a half to 3,000 mosquitoes a night. So a good natural defence that you could look to do is actually put up some bat boxes um, to provide roosting habitat to encourage bats in and around the garden. Um, and... I, I usually put up the uh, what's ca classed as the a Kent style bat, bat box, um, as long as it's got a, a 15 mil cavity. So I mean, you can make them yourself. Um, just a bit, a bit of sort of wooden six inch gravel board, um, you know, with another one fixed to the face of it, but just with a 15 mil spacer in between. As long as it's got a, a cap on the top, like a bird box, um, and the pipi shells will sort of go up and into that cavity. Um, and I've actually encouraged, you know, whole colonies of pipistrelles. Sometimes now you can see um, many different, well, actually three to four, even in some boxes um, of the pipistrelles. So they're a great one. And the bat boxes themselves, if you can get them on a, a south or west facing, uh, because contrary to birds, obviously bird boxes you're supposed to put on a, an east or a north facing boundary so they don't get too hot and the chicks don't. Um, die from the heat um, unfortunately but it does happen uh, whereas bats love to be warm during the day so south or west facing part of the, the house um, or a tree normally you would want to aim to get them sort of three to four meters off the ground so for any of you that don't like ladders myself included um, it can be a bit tricky um, but you can of course you know get them just as high up as you can and just remember they need to have clear access you know there's no point putting a box there and having a load of vegetation all around it because they need that access in and out a bit like a bird box um so yeah i think well, we've got a few more comments about that um, um yeah because um Renika saying also my idea about the bat box and amanda i want to dig a pond that live right on the canal ducks to use my garden are there any plants that would filter out the mess they deposit um short answer no um it's very tricky once you get ducks into a garden. Uh, I had I did a pond for somebody last year uh, and they backed onto a, a quite a big pond, almost like a lake. Um, and uh, yeah, once the ducks got in the garden, of course they're, they're um, well, 
a insert whatever expletive word you like to put, uh, but can be a, a, a bit of a pain with, with fresh planting as well, because I've just planted all the plugs around this pond, the plug plants, and there they were something to do. They were just pulling them out after the day after I'd gone. And, uh, and before you know it, because of the excrement, you know, they can turn a pond into almost green soup, which is not the nicest. So, um, but of course, then you think, well, do I net the pond? Well, of course, if you net the pond, then you're going to have, um, you know, you're going to restrict access for the other birds to come and bathe and drink as well. So a bit of a catch 22. Um, yeah, difficult one with, with ducks. Obviously don't encourage them into, I'm not suggesting you do, but don't encourage them into your garden um, by feeding them or anything. That's what the, the mistake the previous uh, people I did the pond for did, but they soon stopped. <laughs> um, so it is, it is a bit tricky with ducks. The, the good thing uh, or the best thing to do, I think, is to, if you can make it not, I don't know how open the situation is with the pond, but if you can, the ducks like to have a fairly open um, sort of access in and out, obviously for flying in and flying out, and they won't enjoy it as much if there's some vegetation around it, because of course they they feel a bit more at risk from predation from a cat or something. So uh, maybe a bit more vegetation if you can around the pond, but of course equally you don't want to shade the pond out. So um, yeah, a bit of a tricky one with the ducks. They are a bit of a, a bane or can be. Um, People like them, of course, you know, and it's great when the, you know, the ducklings are out this time of year. But um, yeah, ducks can be a bit of a problem. So, but in in a uh, long way around, effectively, you no, know, there's nothing you can put in the pond. Once they're there, they can make a bit of a mess. And like I say, the, the water will go very soup coloured. If you manage to deter them and they don't come back, then just get as much oxygenating plant in there as you can. Things like hornwort, spiked water mill foil, and um, I think really they will be the best things because they're going to oxygenate the water as fast as possible to get it back to the right sort of pHs and, and get it into a, a clear water body again. So hopefully that helps. I mean, do say if you you know if there's any other questions you've got on that, but yeah. hopefully. Um, Sorry, I was also thinking about just going back to the question about mosquitoes. What about <clears throat> installing fish or even um, what about tadpoles when they eat mosquitoes? Yeah. So, so there's a lot of things that do obviously eat mosquito larvae they're great food even things like dragonfly damselfly nymphs um you know mosquitoes diving beetles so again the more you can encourage into a pond um in terms of habitat or around the garden so get yourself plenty of sort of log stacks around the garden um even bits of bark frogs absolutely love being under just you know if you can get a big piece of bark it's great for them to get under because of course cats can't get to them um and and leave some long grass around the edge of the pond. I mean, a lot of people, of course, you know, when you think of a meadow and it's cut once a year, um, or a herbaceous border, we tend to trim them back. But if you can, get uh, or leave some areas around the pond longer, because of course that will just encourage uh, the froglets once they emerge in the next few weeks, just to, that little habitat for them to sort of hunt through to get mini invertebrates and, and, and slugs and things. Um, so some vegetation around the edges is good because of course that's the frogs are going to feel more if you've just got a, a hole in the middle of the garden uh, a frog's not going to hang around there because it's open to predation from everything but you know herons birds all sorts um so yeah so provide cover for frogs is probably a good one for combating the, the mosquito larvae again i would say um, well, we'll go to becky's question <clears throat> in fact actually it's to do with ducks isn't it even though even without the issue of ducks how does one keep a pond clean Okay, um, let me just, because Claire has actually indicated she wanted to ask a question, so let's get Claire on first. So, Claire. Hi, Joel. Uh, Hi, Claire. Oh, get my video going as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, as you know, I love my barrel pond and it has been absolutely brilliant. I've got a tiny garden and years and years ago, I sunk one of those half um, whiskey barrels in one of the raised beds. It did take a few years, but I got frogs in it. Actually, I got frogs quite quickly. It took years to get frog spawn, but I now consistently have frog spawn. Yeah. What I wanted to know is, is there an, a good way to encourage dragonflies? I do occasionally get dragonflies in the garden, very rarely, but I don't think I've got any um, larva in the actual pond itself. Okay, yeah. So um, 
the dragonflies, so if you want, um, one thing you can do is if you've got some, uh, any rotten logs or anything that's kind of half decaying, if you actually put a rotten log half in the pond and half out the pond, um, that's the favourite laying spots for the southern hawker dragonflies, which of course, if you're familiar, you know, big dragonfly this is, and they're up there with the emperors. Females bright green, uh, males sort of blue and green, um, but they are, the, the females will come and they will, they've got this, awesome little hook actually that they kind of prise into the, the the rotting timber and that's where they lay their larvae in the edge of the kind of the log but it, it usually has to be right sort of on the edge of a pond because of course larvae will crawl out you know and then go into the pond uh, and hunt for the food so um that's one thing you can do for southern hawkers for um some of your damselfly species you know blue-tailed damselfly large red damselfly which you obviously on the wing now are starting to emerge um the nymph so of course a lot smaller so the food's going to be a lot smaller but things like you know the mosquito larvae um i'm not i wouldn't know how to say to attract mosquito larvae uh, even if you wanted me to uh, but they just appear you know so as long as there's plenty of vegetation in the pond so things like your um your hornwort and your spiked water milfoil your oxygenators are going to be great uh, plants for that equally things like your broadleaf pond weed um for you know sort of little ram's horn snails and things um they're good as well because the, the snails will actually eat, eat the leaves of that so that will get you snails in there um but but not that the nymphs will, will eat the snails as such but it's the smaller invertebrates um which are going to be you know part of that food chain which will just appear uh, and of course as long as you've got some open water that's where you will hopefully get some water boatmen coming in um and of course the baby water boatmen yeah there is such a thing it's like yeah, about this big you know it is like a black pin prick but of course it's all food for these nymphs um so the more food you can encourage and you know the only way you can really do that is by having the vegetation to bring in um you know the other insects but so like i say probably you know making sure you've got plenty of of um your, your oxygenating plants uh some emergent vegetation like a hard rush or flowering rush or something coming out of one side for them to obviously climb up um and then obviously hatch into the adult form and then really it's just a case of hoping that you know or having enough sun you want some sun on the pond for a reasonable amount of the day um which will just give it its life and then once you've done that you can't really do a lot more you know it's just waiting for everything else to turn up um but they will be there it's, it's funny how much stuff you miss and often it's when i'm clearing back vegetation in the autumn that i'll find the exuvia uh on a stem or something you know um obviously i know i've just contradicted myself there because i said leave the vegetation around the edges but some of the biggest stuff like the purple loose strife obviously if they've got six foot stems that start folding over um you know and it's normally springtime and i do it in march anyway but if you cut them back sometimes you can find the dragonfly exuvia or the spent cases of the the um nymphs on those stems so they, you don't necessarily see them but they have been and gone um uh, but yeah and, and by having the um the insects as well so if we look outside of the barrel when you talk about the adult insects you know of these um, large red damselflies and the blue tail damselflies and all your dragonfly species you know they're only going to come into the garden as adults if there is for two reasons one to obviously lay in your barrel pond uh, and two to um, obviously catch the insects that they're going to going to prey on and of course you know the only way to get more insects into the garden is have more wildflowers so of course the more plants you can have in and around the pond you know things like your cuckoo flower um, your purple loose strife marsh marigold you know all things like this which are going to encourage those insects in the dragonflies are going to be hunting back and forth over the water body uh, because they do actually and a lot of people say to me why have i got dragonflies in my garden i don't even have a have a pond uh, and what it is is once they they actually emerge as an adult they will go off to basically strengthen themselves up you know um uh, and you know feed up on other insects before they then try and effectively take on another male to to claim that pond for themselves so when a female now comes past they can say hey look at my pond you know uh, what do you think so they actually they do go off for a, a period to actually sort of build themselves a bit of weight training if you like um before they come back um and inhabit or try and inhabit a, a water body so that's why people see them sometimes sat on the edge of a wood or you know sat at the bottom of the garden on a bush and think what is that doing here you know but of course they eat insects so that's where they're, they're hunting for them um so I hope that's kind of answered the question a bit. 
so uh, enough I've, I've got a piece of wood in my i was saying about the pebble pond and it, it's probably about yeah a couple of foot foot deep and it it's primarily meant that you put water it's the water container i guess that you then put yeah. a grid over and i've just thought oh that's a decent enough size i'll use that as my second barrel pond yes um and another one i got was a big massive great big black planter that again is just filled up with water Mm. Um, and it is it's amazing what does come into it without you actually having to put oh, yeah. in. Mm. And I, but I have got on the other one which I've got a small um, water lily in I did put a bit of wood on that for things to get out so that's the one yeah. that's more likely to get one the yeah, so ac access is a good thing you've picked up on there which obviously you, you, you know um, just everything getting in and out is, is key mm. obviously once it's at ground level it's better but of course the barrel ponds I'm talking about are above ground level um, but it's mostly as well for things like, I mean, bumblebees, the amount of bumblebees I see just on their back, you know, buzzing around in a pond going, get me out of here, you know, which is, they're just so clumsy that the, a lot of the queens when they first emerge, they're just, uh, and they will actually sit on a, a lily leaf, um, you know, and just have a drink of water. But of course, they're, they're sometimes a bit heavy. I mean, in theory, bumblebees shouldn't even be able to fly, you know, when you look at the wings versus the weight that they are, uh, but they, they obviously can. But obviously so having that stick it just enables anything like that just to call out mm -hmm. if it gets stuck in yeah. so yes can we go back to becky becky's asking how to keep uh, a pond clean i mean i yeah. guess i guess a lot of that's down to positioning isn't it because if you have a pond which is underneath a tree you're going to get loads of leaves in it yeah so it is good if you have got a tree in a, a shady situation to net it in the autumn just because the leaves i had an issue with my pond i was, I was working working away uh, last autumn and I didn't net the pond in time and a load of the leaves dropped in and of course I tried to fish a few out but in between jobs it was a bit tricky and it, and it does it just turns the water a bit of a black colour if you're not careful because it's all that rotting vegetation just adds to the nutritional value um, so if you can net your pond or if you position in a new pond bring it away from trees of course so you're going to get less you know leaf litter in it um, but to keep to keep it clean, the the, the key is uh, also your oxygenating plants. I know I keep banging on about them, but they're probably the key in, um, element. You know your horn uh, hornwort or spiked water milfoil, like I say, because they're your oxygenators. They're what's going to make it look like gin effectively, um, and ha stop it having you know kind of a discoloration. Um, stagnant water tends to go a bit sort of green or darker colour. So the more you can have that, the better. Um, Equally, if you get duckweed, that can be a bit persistent and, and it's obviously, I've seen entire ponds covered with duckweed, so the best thing is just to try and net it out. A bit of a tedious, laborious job, but it, it is doable. Um, yeah, so hopefully that helps, Becky. Um, <laughs> yeah, the like, oxygenators and away from trees if you can. Yeah, also, what's interesting also is, is this whole idea about um, alien plants because you know people want to decorate their ponds with these like exotic lilies or exotic things and then suddenly like for example i'm here in extra Majuda, and one of the main problems i have in the rivers is water hyacinth it's just yeah. completely blocks everything yeah what do you say to people who want to sort of try and add these non-natives to their um well i think it's 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 so easily done unfortunately because a lot of the garden centers are um they're not thoroughly educated enough in my eyes and they shouldn't be selling people well of course it's a, a lot of it will come down to staffing because of course you could have somebody that works for a garden center that says oh yes you want a lily here's a lily you know and and so on but i mean even the labels are a bit misleading sometimes and unless you know these species um it can be problematic i mean things like the canadian pondweed you know can you know people sell it a lot as water uh, as um oxygenating plant but it just takes over the pond and then people say oh we've got no room it's just vegetation you know um so it is difficult when garden centers are selling things that's the same as double-headed flowers you know you know which of course are no good for insects because they can't get to the pollen or the nectar in the middle you know you know roses and things um it can be a real problem for insects but yet the garden there needs to be a reform and that's a topic for another day uh, but you know there needs to be a reform in in garden centers what they should and shouldn't sell in, in my eyes but equally with pond plants it is difficult because of course the non-native stuff you know that a lot of it is is bred scientifically to to look better or you know to um 
to enhance the way we see a pond. But, it, you know, in reality, you look at the, the flower of a, a fringed water lily, the native water lily, it's only probably sort of yay big, but it's, you know, a lovely little bright yellow, almost sort of like buttercup um, type flower. But people want big, blousy lilies, you know, which which are fine in a massive form of fish pond that you know that's maybe a few a few hundred square meters. But um, it is a bit difficult with with. Um, I mean, it's easy as well to get hung up on native versus non-native. So much stuff has you know moved you know with with over the last three four hundred years that you know. I've, I've just done a video today on red valerian, which is, I absolutely love red valerian, but of course it was introduced in the 17th century. But it's one of those things that, you know, people say, like the sycamore tree. But you look at a sycamore tree now, I've got one in the back garden now, and it's full of blue tits, house sparrows, they're all going down, pecking the aphids off it, and it's a great source of food. So native versus non-native, I kind of say, well, if something's providing food for wildlife, then, you know, uh, just accept it. Yeah, as long as it is, is it, it is doing that, you know. Yeah, I mean, you've got things like like what the, the species you talked about, pus budlia, it's another great thing, obviously with butterflies. In. But the, I mean, I, I remember when I was writing my book, I was looking at the Garden um, Horticultural Society and they were recommending, what, some 35,000 different types of plants you can plant in your garden or something. And obviously most of them are not native. Yeah. That is bewildering. And as as, as you said, I think there must be, there must be some kind of, uh, you know, system whereby people can be responsible. Maybe there should be like a proper kind of, not organic, but a proper, mm. you know, na natural uh, place where they sell things that are only good for your local environment. Um, behind anyone listening to this, behind the scenes, I'm working on a, a, a wildlife friendly garden centre. <laughs> in the next five to ten years so hopefully i think that you know there's a big there's a big um call for something like that because of course a lot of these places they're they're not selling the right stuff and if they are selling it they're not selling silver birch trees and rowan trees which we want to plant for the birds you know and if they are selling them they're selling the the, the white bark to um virtually utilis form you know so it's things that i think there's a there is a definitely an opening in the market there but coming back to what you say dave it is difficult to know what to plant however however if you're unsure of what to plant there's one of these available now um well we have got, actually got a section in the back which is great if for anyone jokes to one side where um we've labeled all of the what i would say the the best plants for a pond a meadow herbaceous borders what trees and shrubs um and it, it, it's good. I actually use it as a as a resource myself when I'm designing gardens because it's easy. The amount of plants that are out there, I think, actually, what am I, you know? And it's it's good to sort of jog your memory because you forget half of them, you know. Yeah. Um, you better go back to Amanda because she yeah. said, if I grow plants for butterflies to lay eggs on and feed caterpillars, can I do this in pots rather than have them in my borders? Will there be enough food for them? Absolutely. Um, I often grow. Um, things in plats, uh, pots. I've got some purple toad flax, uh, actually, which is you, you might find it growing in the gravel. Uh, a lovely little, almost like snapdragon flower, purple flower, really thin, spindly thing. You, you wouldn't think much. You wouldn't look twice at it uh, a lot of the time. But it's because uh, I'm down in the in the southeast, um, uh, and and down here we've started getting more and more of the, a moth called the toad flax brocade bit of a mouthful but it comes in and it lays its eggs on these purple toad flax and I have that in pots specifically for that and they're fantastic they're a bit like mullein moths if you know the mullein moth um but you're sort of black and yellow uh, and a bit of sort of bluey green on them as well um but yeah absolutely I mean you know lavender is obviously a classic which because then you know while these plants are in pots you can move them around the garden um garlic mustard I mean anyone that comes around who sees the pot in the garden with garlic mustard in it they'll think you've just left it and not bothered with it but you know they're a great great plant because i mean you know i mentioned orange tips earlier but green vein white butterflies will also lay their eggs on the lower leaves um and uh, you know all sorts of plants will go well in pots as long as they've got enough sun and as long as they've got enough water um you'll be absolutely fine yeah no problem at all um i don't think there's any more questions at the moment Dave. Is there? go on then my question is for those who haven't got gardens or if you do possess a garden it's a concrete one um i know it's a big subject maybe for another day in fact probably for another day but this could be a nice little warm up warm up what would you suggest i mean again it's difficult to tell until you see a garden i suppose but i've lived in notting hill in london 
and the garden I had there, or my mate's garden, was basically a concrete patio with brick walls around us and hardly a lick of green. Yeah, I still recorded about 50 species of bird over 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, probably just moved, to be fair. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, th th there are obviously challenges in all of them. We've not all got the money because, of course, a lot of the time you may be renting. So, you know, your landlord might not want you to rip up all the paving because it suits them, it's rentable, and they can say, oh, yes, you know, here you go, here's... You know, you, you can come and have a little patio area and all the rest of it. But um, but then in that case, I would say containers. And, and jokes to one side, we've just talked about a barrel pond. It's amazing what will come and find a barrel pond. You know, all, all kinds of insects, pond skaters, water boatmen. You don't think of them as flying insects when you see them sat on top or underneath the water. Uh, but of course, that's how they find these water bodies. So a barrel pond, absolutely. Uh, raised beds, just as good. You know, you get things in like Napita, the catmint, uh, salvias, echinaceas, uh, purple, uh, not purple loose strife, uh, verbena bonarientis, my all time favourite herbaceous perennial. You get stuff like that in, and it'll just be buzzing with. I mean, you probably remember, Dave, two years ago at the bird fair when we did that pop up um, uh, nectar border outside the arts marquee. And it was just those people stood there all day photographing the butterflies and the bees. And this is in the middle of a field. You know, uh, uh, and these insects have found, they've got an amazing sense of smell, butterflies and bees. Uh, and they've just found it. And, and, you know, so raised beds, another good one. They'll dry out a bit quicker, obviously, than a, a, than a bed at ground level. Uh, but, you know, a bit of water, raised beds, absolutely the way forward. And grow things up the wall as well, you know, put some trellis systems up, provide cover for birds. You'll know as well as I do, the biggest problem for house sparrows is, is cover. You know, uh, in urban areas, they'll you get a lone I've got one out the back here a big buddlet and I've got a colony of 20 to 30 house sparrows that live in it in, in one bush you know as long as you provide a bit of cover the, the birds will turn up so vertical space is just as key and I'm going to do a video about this on YouTube shortly just as just as good than your, uh, as your horizontal space definitely um, all right and question from Jennifer here can you recommend any intro to gardening courses ideally a distance of bleak part-time course I work full-time in conservation but would like to increase my knowledge of gardening generally when talking to people about wildlife gardening and of course improve her own uh i'm going to sound like a i'm on repeat here but i'm actually working on a gardening course <laughs> um which is something that i'm hoping to set up within the next two to three months so that people can do an online course um to well it's where it's how long is a piece of string really as you can sort of gauge from today i mean i could talk for 10 hours straight about you know gardening for wildlife and i would barely touch the surface um but but i would i do want to i think there is a need definitely because uh, we do run a few courses obviously yearly but I get a bit of limited time but the the main thing is of course you've got people in scotland wales ireland you know they can't afford to come over or you know put themselves up for a day's course and and really you know, you need uh, a bit of um, a course structure as well. You know, if you're going to actually talk about gardening for wildlife, there's so many elements. And I'm, I'm conscious that we've not actually spoke about design at all today. Uh, well, no, we have actually. We've talked about some layouts of things. But um, I think the main thing is that people want to know how to set their garden out. Um, and one thing that I would say in terms of the, the, this, which is kind of linked to Jennifer's question, is when you actually go to plan a garden um you know the, there's four elements that you really want to put into a garden and that's trees and shrubs for birds a mini wildflower meadow and i did say meadow but that can be as small as two or three square meters uh, a wildlife pond and herbaceous borders for obviously butterflies bees and everything else a nectar border if you like and if you've got those four elements um that and, and in the book it does explain this quite nicely but if you've got those four elements you then you know so let's say for example you've got a north facing garden but it's a fairly long terrace garden perhaps you will get sun down the bottom end of it because obviously the house will cast shade you know for the first three four five meters but after that you'll get a fair bit of sun so you would want to position your trees and shrubs and everything along the bottom of the garden um so that, that was casting shade nicely over to the neighbor's side um but you know so that's how you set it out and then something like the pond i mean i always try and put ponds almost as a focal point in the garden like right in bang in the middle you know to get the most sunlight 
Um, and they are the epicenter of a wildlife garden, if you like. They are the best thing you can put in a garden. Um, and then fill in with your, you know, your wildflower meadow around it. And then your herbaceous board is just check to see where the sun is. So if you've north facing garden, as you look down the garden, your left hand side is going to get the morning sun. So you could do a herbaceous board there. Your right hand side is going to get the afternoon sun. And of course, butterflies, bees and other insects are going to want to feed all day long while the sun is shining, most of them. So you need to provide nectar and they prefer to do it where it's hot. You know, they are insects that they are creatures that, that admire the sun so they want to be warm while they're feeding who doesn't um so you know by putting herbaceous borders in two parts of the garden you're sort of ticking both boxes in terms of the the morning and the afternoon sun and, and that's of course going to be crucial for the butterflies which are more sun loving i mean i've seen bees out there in five six seven degrees in overcast conditions in you know february time and they're just bees are very hardy but butterflies need to be able to warm up they need to, to sort of warm the flight muscles more so by putting herbaceous borders in those positions you are you are ticking more boxes and and providing for all otherwise the butterflies uh, they'll just nip over into the neighbor's garden and say oh well if there's not enough food here i'll go and get some over there you know um but generally setting out a garden those are the four main elements so your trees and shrubs for birds because that's you all know, Dave, you know, you want to provide cover. Birds need cover. You know, wherever you are around the world, there's there's hawks, you know, sparrowhawks and that that will be looking to take birds in urban areas, peregrines and bigger cities and things. So, of course, they want to feel safe. Um, so providing cover for birds and making the most of your vertical spaces, like I say, with trainer wires, things like hops, honeysuckle, ivy, you know, let them flower. Ivy is so underrated as a um, a climbing plant you know because of course you've got berries for birds in the autumn you've got bird bo bird nesting potential for robins nest a little bird bo robin box in some ivy guaranteed it'll get used um you know you've got the holly blue butterfly that lays its eggs on it in the autumn um so you know climbers and everything up the spaces where you don't want to put trees and shrubs to, to cover those walls like you say dave if you're in an urban environment um, things like winter flowering jasmine is great if you've got a north facing shady wall but even honeysuckle will do reasonably well uh, and create that cover you know and, and that's one of the key things is just making cover for things because the birds won't come in people put a, a feeder in the middle of a lawn and think well why have i not got any birds on it you know but of course sparrowhawk comes over the fence they've they're gone aren't they you know they've got no chance um, so where you can, if you're putting feeders in the garden as well, put them next to that cover or, you know, hang them off, um, you know, uh, the edge of a shrub or something so they can just zip in and off. Um, the house sparrows here get through a phenomenal amount of sunflower hearts. <laughs> I ought to cut down really, they're a bit spoiled, but it's, but it's great, you know, and, and they love it and they're there for a reason. Um, oh, what's Claire said now? So how a sparrow hawk take out a wood pigeon this yeah. morning? That's your question beforehand from Renee. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Renee. Uh, yeah. Do you have any book recommendations for gardening for wildlife for those living in the West Coast of the US? And don't worry if you don't. <laughs> I wish you one of these, Renee. If you like. <laughs> uh, no, well, I'm, a, I'm actually in talks with um, Dorling Kinsley about doing a US version of the book, which is hopefully going to come out next spring. Um, because there's been so many people getting touched from the States, actually, which is, which is fantastic because it shows that, you know, there's interest worldwide, but everybody, of course, everybody wants to see the bit for wildlife. But um, I'm not aware of any at the moment, Renee, and that's not me trying to, you know, get another sale. I'm generally not aware, obviously, with the US book markets, but um, I no doubt there are people out there who are doing backyard gardens and things. Um, but I, yeah, I really would like to get this book in the States because there's been a huge call for it. Um, and seriously, if you do send your address or something, I can see if we can get one shipped out to you, if, if that does help. Um, Tony, um you need to ask a question. Audio on. Yeah, it was a. It's a pond question, really. Um, and it's been a. Uh, we've lived here in France for a couple of years now. Um, and our big conundrum is that the person we bought the house from obviously had very him or his predecessor had very grand ideas and wanted a pond, but they haven't. For my. Um, amateur eyes haven't built it deep enough so it's fed by the river it backs onto the river so it's in the winter we get oh, it's it's just basically flooded yeah that part of the land but as the summer progresses here they're fiercely hot so already our pond is about a foot and a half down mm. so 
trying to put in oxygenated implants and all those things what what how do I meet a halfway house because last year I thought I nearly lost all my lilies the water was that low yeah well I mean in in nature of course some of the best ponds are ones that actually dry out in the summer which sounds horrific but of course they, they do um so did you say it is spread uh, sorry fed by a spring from the river it's fed by the river itself so it float the river flows in through an uh, like two uh, uh, an arm and then another a smaller pond with the lilies in and then into the main pond and out okay um and you say you've got um what sort of depth is it would you say does it dry out completely then or you say it didn't quite last year um i think um last year we probably had if we were lucky about a foot in the actual basin of it okay yeah which is all you'll need for things like your um well depending on what time of year it is of course a lot of dragonflies will have will have emerged as an adult form by then but but of course a lot of dragonfly species the nymphs will actually stay as dragonflies um for two or three years in, in, in a pond so they'll obviously want to have that water body there all the time but it's just if it supports enough wildlife for them to predate and for the cycle to continue of course um have you got any means how how far is it from the from the house um, we've got a funny garden. He's got a big garden around the house and then across the lane is the rest of the garden. So it's not, I suppose it's about um, 150 metres from the house, 200 metres from the house. So watering cans isn't ideal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was going to say... We've if got it's wells in... though, so I suppose that's, I didn't even think about that. We've got underground wells. Yeah. I mean, one thing you could actually do, it sounds ludicrous, but um, it is try, try to actually dig it deeper if you can. I mean, what sort of depth would you say the, the water body is when it's, you know, at a good level in the winter? Two or three feet? Yeah. Okay. So it might be worth trying to just increase the depth so that if, obviously, if it's fed by the river, then of course, I mean, does the river ever dry out fully or? Well, that's the problem. When the water levels in the river get really low, it looks like deliverance with all the trees at the side. Um, <laughs> so as a, as a consequence, um, when the river, the river levels are low, the pond levels are low. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, because what I was going to suggest is if it's in the back garden, of course, you can look to maybe hook up, um, you know, uh, an overflow system from your downpipes on your house to to put, you know, into the pond. So, of course, it's all, all the natural way rainwater is, is feeding into the pond. Um, but, of course, if it's, you know, 150 metres away, it's, it's mm. a lot of pipe and digging under a road by the sounds of it. So, not mm. very feasible. But, but I would, unless it dries out completely, in which case then there's not a lot you can do, of course, Part bar from running a, running a hose over to it, um, which again is a very long way. Um, I would look to maybe dig it a little bit deeper, just so that it holds a little bit water, a bit a little bit more water to uh, for a bit longer to um, to maybe see if it can you know last the summer. What sort of sorry, I didn't ask what sort of size it was roughly. Um, it's about probably about thirty foot, thirty five feet wide. Um, by about 40 foot the other way. Size then, yeah. So a lot of digging involved. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, I mean, it always looks like Bisto in the summer. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I've, oxygenate, I've been listening with interest to your thing about oxygenating plants and kind of wondering, well, what could I do with the water that dries out, the pond that dries out so mm. quickly well, in the summer? usually by then i mean i wouldn't worry too much because of course you've got the river which is going to feed life back into the pond when it comes up to natural level anyway uh, and, and if it if it dries out obviously you know all you can really do is perhaps look to um maybe what you could do actually um, i like making work more work for people uh is, is maybe put in another little pond up near the house or something um if that's feasible so that you know should things get really dire in the main pond you can perhaps look to um you know transport some of the the animals and creatures in in a, in a couple of buckets up to the top pond so at least you are trying to save a few if that makes sense yeah okay thank you but but i would yeah it sounds like a, a, a reasonable water body to to have to dig out by hand so <laughs> um 
but but of course the more the, the bigger the water body and the deeper it is the longer it does hold water naturally so um if you just said my pond's about two meters by three meters then obviously it's not so much of a problem but yeah um sorry i hope that helps and um, which part of france are you in by the way southwest charlotte maritime oh okay yeah oh lovely yeah, yeah, no, it does get quite warm down there, doesn't it? So um, I believe this week it's supposed to be nearly 30 degrees down there, isn't it? Well, it's been pretty hot today. Mm. So I had my little run up and down, that my coronavirus run up and down the garden before we came on. So I had a proper dab on. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> well, do no, do no, um, do keep me posted on that one and, and do feel free to send some pics. I'm sure Dave will get your details if, if we can. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Ernie. Um, right. I think we've come to the point where it's kind of near the end. No worries. Near the end. I mean, it's been a fantastic, absolutely fantastic session. And I you hope it will back. Helpful. I don't know, because it's, it's, it's funny when you start on these um, things, you kind of go off in one direction, then you get a, you hit a tangent, and then you go off in another. But yeah. I, I hope from everyone that's you know joined us today, and thank you for that, that it's been informative. And um, I'm sure you probably guessed I could talk the hind legs off a donkey. So, you know. Um, I suppose all I can do from here, Dave, is say that, you know, if anybody does want to get in touch, um, I'm on Twitter, um, at underscore Joel Ashton, um, or email, we've got the website, hazelwoodlandscapes.com, and, and of course, contact Dave, you know, um, we can change details that way. If anybody has any more questions, we would be happy to answer. Okay, well, I need to ask you a couple more questions before we say goodbye, and mm, I didn't sure. have to tell you about these questions before, I should have done, so my, my bad. What's your favourite bird? Ah, uh, house mine. What's your favourite fish? Fish? Hmm. Good one. Probably perch. My dad used to call them little footballers of the underworld because they're, they're fantastic striped bellies. Yeah, a bit like a Newcastle shirt. <laughs> <laughs> favourite invertebrate? Favourite invertebrate? <sighs> that includes butterflies. Yeah. <laughs> it's got to be the orange tip. It's got to be the orange tip butterfly. What's your favourite mammal? Mammal? Uh, you should have asked me these before, actually. I know, shit, sorry. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Yeah, mammal. Um, we can come back to that. What's your favourite uh, invert? What's your favourite um, amphibian? Amphibian? It's got to be smooth new. And your favourite plant? Herbaceous border or wildflower? <laughs> I'll give you. I'll give you my herbaceous border is by far. It's probably got to be uh, Verbena bonariensis, the, the tall, tall purple flower. Brilliant. And wildflower, it's got to be bird's foot trefoil. Just fantastic little wildflower. Good for so many insects. Okay. And if you could be anywhere in this world, notwithstanding COVID nineteen, where would you be right this very second? Um, probably at my house in France, trying to get it ready for. <laughs> living in no I'm not moving to France but <laughs> no I'd be I think I'd be in France if I could sat by the river okay cool so to give you a little couple of minutes to think about um <clears throat> to think about your favorite mammal I'm just going to quickly run through quickly also plug in my computer before it dies um run through who's going to be on in conservation with over the next few days um tomorrow I have uh, Stuart Winter who is a journalist with the Express newspaper in the UK. Um, he's very opinionated. Um, I know him quite well. And he's gonna be talking about micro birding, intensely watching local patches. Um, on Wednesday, we have another person after your own heart, Joel. We've got Kate Bradbury. Kate, I did see that, yeah, brilliant. Kate is, um, is basically, again, she gardened for wildlife, so it's another perspective on, on gardening. So that's on Wednesday. Looking forward to that. Don't one. forget to ask her, quiz her about our ponds getting on because I built it. <laughs> okay, I will. <laughs> or you can even join us and ask her yourself. Yeah, no, I will do. I'm free, um, yeah. oh, on Thursday, we have an amazing artist. He's an is a, um, up and coming wildlife bird artist. Um, I can't pronounce his name. He's from Hungary. His name, and please excuse me, looks like Shabolks, Shabolks or something like that. Um, but he is, I mean, I've met him a few times, lovely man, and he's going to be painting live watercolour painting of a kingfisher and wow. giving us advice 
as to how to paint. So that should be really fascinating. Details will be on the website fairly shortly. They're not there now, but it will be there by tomorrow. On Friday, we've got this 14-year-old kid, a sensation called Kabir Kool, and he is from oh, London, um, born in um, Dubai. He's mental about birding and wildlife. He's really trying to get people engaged in wildlife, and he's been on this sort of single boy crusade, and he's already won awards for his, his work in conservation. He's one to watch. And then on Saturday, and I literally just got the confirmation just now, we have a guy called Tony Juniper, who is the head guy at English Nature. Um, quite a controversial group, English Nature, part of the government. And they've been behind a couple of decisions that have kind of got conservationists or birders and people like that up in arms occasionally. The latest of which has been the, um, the idea of allowing peregrines to be um, taken from the wild for falconing, falconing even. Falcon even so um, that's going to be an interesting discussion there not trying no. to finish the name but I think I saw something about um, the black-headed gull and common gull eggs as well recently allowed to be taken I think so yeah we're we'll, we'll going to be talking about all those things so that should be a, a very interesting discussion on Saturday so without further ado thank you so much Joel for for this amazing um, session it's been really informative and I'm glad I'm sure people in the uh, all our Zoomers here have enjoyed it. I'm sure you have, because um, no one's left, so they obviously must have done. Um, and I look forward um, to seeing you again, and I look forward to seeing the Zoomers again, and other people as well, so tell your friends. Um, but until tomorrow, keep safe, and don't forget to keep looking up, and we will all meet again. Thanks very much, and thank you, John. Cheers, thank you. See you later. Bye.